All right. So first of all, we have to do a little housekeeping. Um, I have to show you my policy about late papers. Late papers, right? Assuming there's no legitimate reasons. Uh, two days is a third of a grade lower. One, then it was one week. Yeah, you sent out an email saying it was a week and a half. No, I, yeah, I just want to say this is what it originally said. And then I did say that you could hand it in later. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is that I even said two weeks, actually, Alexis. It's just that it's been two weeks and I still am not getting stuff. So that's what, that's what I'm trying to do the red flag about. So all I wanna say is that I gave you a lot more leniency than I did in the syllabus. Gotcha. Um, Mine, does that count for the papers we worked on? Because I am working, I'm trying to work on everything, plus the papers you gave back to me, plus another class's work. Right. Well, you know, it doesn't count for the one that you're trying to rewrite. Mm. But after that, yeah. I can't. You know, if it's two weeks late, it's a problem. <laughs> Got you. That's the main thing, right? Um, plus, I'm not going to be as tough. I'm not going to give you an F uh, if it's late, if it's super late. Uh, two weeks late in a decent paper, I'll get a D. I'm not going to do that. Um, I'll give you, if you hand it in, by you know next Monday, um, it'll just be a grade lower. But I just there are a lot of students who are just way behind, so I I don't really want to get a whole bunch of stuff dumped on me. Um, so how about I'll put it this way: I'm going to make a new set of rules <laughs> because it's been two weeks. So if you're number week number one. If you hand week number one at this point, it'll be a grade lower because it's more than two weeks late. If it's week number two, um, um, if it's week number two, then that's gonna be two weeks late, that's okay. So week number one, posts or, um, Paper number and this, is, and this is by Monday, right? Or this week? Okay, week number one and paper number one, if you, that is already one grade lower um, and you have to get it in by this Friday, right? Friday at 6 p.m. So you can write that. Week number two, um, the post and the paper would be, that is going to be two weeks late at this point. So that would be also a grade lower. Okay. Then week number three is, if you hand it in this weekend, it'll be no change in the grade. But if you wait another week, it'll be a grade lower. And then week number four, the thing about it is everything is due by June 30th, because the grades are due July 30th. The grades are absolutely due the very next day. And there's nothing I can do about that. And I'm not gonna give everybody incomplete. So that's the way it is. The final is due July 30th. And it's just like two days after the last day of class, it all is really condensed at the end. So, okay, so this is my promise to you and I will type it in an email, but it's hard for me to believe so many people have waited so long, um, but that's the way it is. Um, yeah, Michael? Um, yeah, so how does like, uh factoring in like that there was a fourth paper and that you said like that's right yeah. I, so 
because I know there's not any more, but I didn't really know how it was going to factor. Because like uh, when you first kind of told us, you just said that we could do we we could just do three, and that we didn't really. That's have true. To That's true. So factoring in, uh, you won't get lower on your second paper if you end up handing in uh, what three papers and a final, right? Okay. Um, but that would mean, right, that you're going to have to do all this work very quickly. Does that make sense? Um, all right. So week number three is no change in the grade. And if it's your second paper, but that would mean you have to hand in a third paper and a final paper, uh, the final week of class, and a post, right? And that would be by um, the last day of class, th uh, Thursday. OK, so I will type all that up. But there are people who are, are going to have just a whole lot to do right at the end. Um, okay, so um, I don't I don't like doing this to you, but um, you signed up for the class, so you must have figured you know some kind of time management that you would be able to do the work. Um, all right, now we are on the second day of Hinduism. And I talked about the Gita, the Bhagavad Gita. That's the first part of the lecture for today. And first of all, I just wanted to get your comments, whatever you want to comment on. And then I will have another round of comments on what I said about the Gita. And then I will have another round comments about the nonviolent demonstrations, his, his, the story of Gandhi and how he uh, became the icon that he was. And then the quotes, the reading about um, the one-sided mind, that Western culture is too one-sided. And um, then some quotes. I had some quotes on the outline, and then I'll have you comment on that. So that's four different things. So go ahead. Who wants to start with what they came to class with? Um, I'll start calling on someone if someone doesn't volunteer. So. I can. Oh, okay. You're fine, Tim. Oh, there's Tim. Very good. Well, um, I wrote. Oh man, I wrote that. so I wrote something about when I was reading it about Mysterium Trem... Tremendum. Tremendum. And I looked at um, letter G when it talks about um, dualistic. And hold on, I gotta go. Oh, I don't think I can. I have to do off my iPad. Hold on. Mark. Um, right. So it was talking about... Why not? Um, I, I wrote it down. Okay, so it says, appease wrath and desire and yearning, positive self surrender. I didn't really understand that part. Can you explain further? Oh, under the outline about the Mysterium Tremendum? Yes. Okay. He was just looking for patterns in the different religious traditions. And one pattern is this conversion experience where you feel this um, power, right? Much greater than yourself. And, and it's mysterious, right? It's this huge thing where you feel humbled um, in the face of this force that's much greater than you. So uh, Jesus, when he was baptized, he had something like that. Um, 
Buddha uh, had his meditation, his enlightenment experience. Paul had his road to Damascus experience. Um, and then Arjuna in the Gita had this experience of having this sense of something much greater than yourself. And so you're living for the sake of something much greater than yourself. And for Arjuna, it was uh, Krishna incarnated in the form of a person, but it's really about Rama and karma. And so in book nine of the Gita, there's this revelation of all of being that you understand you're just a part of the huge, huge cosmos. Um, so when uh, in the Baptist church, you know, young people are supposed to have this conversion experience. And I don't know, you know, how radical it is. I know my father uh, was one of those rebellious teenagers and his parents kept saying, well, why don't you have that experience? Kenny, like you're making the neighbors, you're making us look bad in front of the neighbors. And he just thought, forget it. I, you know, I don't feel it and I'm not going to say it just to be socially acceptable. Um, but I've had plenty of students, you know, for whom that's sincere. Um, so, Tim, does that make sense to you? Yes, it does a little bit. Okay. Um, who's next? Who wants to? Um, comment on something. What did they pick from the reading that they want to talk about? Uh, I'll go. Good, Zane. Go ahead. Uh, I kind of found it pretty interesting whenever they talked about how he went to London and stuff like that and like how he tried to pick up on their customs. And then also he read uh, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And he said how it, hit, it went straight to his heart and stuff like that. And I found that kind of cool because, I mean, obviously he's faithful to his religion, but he also, you know, read you know, material from another religion and, you know, it, it still impacted him. I thought that was pretty cool. So now that you've read the Sermon on the Mount, you should be able to understand why he liked it, right? It's very universal it's about purity of heart. Very good saying. Who else? Um, I also thought, um, I also pointed out what Zane was talking about, about how much he um, appreciated Sermon on the Mount and how influential it was. And like, I don't know if this is like a crazy correlation, but it made me think of um, one time when I was going through catechism class, one of our um, uh, like teachers, he was saying how uh, we know Jesus is real. So either he was telling the truth or he's the most evil man on the planet because he's gotten millions to follow him and like it just made me think of that because like I just lost why it made me think of that but I would like it immediately came to my mind um how like he was open to Jesus uh and them being correct <laughs> yeah I mean his main thing was hey Christianity is a really good religion Christians should try it out one of these days <laughs> Remember that? <laughs> there didn't seem to be a correlation between the claim to be a Christian and the Sermon on the Mount. That was a big problem. Um, well, Ryan, go ahead. What did you pick? Can you hear me? It's like really windy and the reception is kind of bad. It's like okay, um, okay. Something that I really liked was the idea of his nonviolence, like resistant movements. I thought that was really interesting because I'm just thinking, like, does nonviolence resistance will that work in like modern day society? And is that the most efficient way to like get things like social reforms done? Like, is it is violence in sometimes is it necessary in some way? That that was just made me spark that question. Okay, so there has been research done, a book by Erica Chenoweth. She came and spoke actually in Little Rock once. She looked at all the nonviolent movements since like 1915 or something. And you look at 10 years afterwards. That's what you really have to do. Because a lot of times violence might change things temporarily, but it after, you know, by 10 years out, it's worse. 
So she found that the nonviolent ones had a much longer, were much, the societies were improved from 10 years on because it brought about a shift and then that shift stayed in place. Whereas the violence might bring a temporary shift, but then there's revenge and all these stories and it goes back. So I don't, I don't think you should think violence works just because right at the moment, sometimes you get what you want. It doesn't work long-term because people hold grudges. Um, so even with Martin Luther King, there's still people who begrudge that or they associate it with violence and it wasn't violent. Um, and so Black Lives Matter, there's already a big backlash against it. Um, and uh, so like you're living through it and you will live through these things again. So it is important for you to study what happened then because you were old enough you know, to be able to follow it. So what were, it had a reputation. Some people thought it was violent. 93% of the people were nonviolent. So there were these false rumors. They were accusing the BLM people of inciting violence. Gee, that happened back with, you know. So if you start to understand these patterns, I think that that's important. Does that make sense, Ryan? Yeah, because it definitely will happen in your lifetime numerous times. There are going to be a lot of resistance movements in your lifetime because of all the change changes going on. Um, Colin? Um, one thing I like is how it refers to Gandhi realizing who he's going against. Uh, that he's going against the British, that he's not going against like Nazis or Russians and things of that nature. So he knows that this nonviolent approach may work. Like it's not a pure shot in the dark. Okay, good. All right. Um, but the other thing is that when the British were there, um, they claim to be, you know, believers in human rights and all this stuff. And then World War I happened. But then World War II, it's like all of Europe got taken over by these fascists, right? Uh, Hitler, Mussolini, Stalin, you know, and, and they're going, what? Like, and they accuse us of being backward? Can you imagine that, Colin? I mean, so uh, I told the story of the Salt Works massacre, and that was the last straw where the West had no more moral authority at all for the people in India. But before that, there was this constant, you know, eroding of moral authority, because if Europe is so advanced, why are they fascists? And why are they, you know, dictators? That was, so they start being suspicious and then, then, then it just all gets exposed at a certain point. Um, but it is true that the British people, after they saw some of those massacres and they found out about it, the people started insisting that the government leave. And, and so that's a good point. Um, okay. Oh, okay. Oh my gosh. Yeah, you have to, when it uploads. Okay, so Michael's gonna shift to his phone, that's fine. Um, tell me when you're shifted, Michael, and then I'll call on you. Alexis. So my commentary for today was about how Gandhi's like overall experience, I can't remember which article it was selected from, like the Gandhi's outlines and all that, basically his life and his message. His message at the very beginning, or like, I can't remember, what is that? I don't know, it's like a little quote for him at the beginning of his thing, like his early years. His like quote, like really like impacted me. I loved, how, I loved reading that and I loved understanding it. Okay, I mean, I have it here. I can read it if you'd like. It's, um, okay. I, lost I lost no time in assuming the authority of a husband. 
Um, I could not go without my permission. So when a 13-year-old Kabasir, I don't know, wished to play games in the street, she had asked her 19-year-old husband, and he had frequently said not, for he was jealous. But she was headstrong and made a point to go out whenever she liked. I see myself in that a lot. I see myself as the type of woman where I'd rather ask for forgiveness than permission, and I will do what I want when I want. So just reading that and then like having to like imagining myself in that situation. If I was 13 years old and I had a husband, how would I feel? I would not be happy. I'll say that right now. It, it just that culture shock, I guess you could say, hit me. Yeah, a lot of my students at Asia University, most of the most of their peers had arranged marriages. And one of them's grandmother was married at age seven. And so a lot of them were married by 13, but mostly, you know, at least before they got out of high school, there's story after story of this. It's amazing. Um, but I mean, the thing is most of those, uh, in the past, in G Gandhi's age, most of those women would comply. So his wife was more uppity than most of them. Does that make sense? I mean, today, I don't think any American women would put up with it. I still hear like of marriage kind of stuff. Like there's a marriage counselor. I still hear that kind of stuff in everyday culture. It just still the fact that like the historic the like age like historic thing of getting an arranged marriage is still going on it just it couldn't be me okay okay that's interesting um michael are you available uh yeah so i was also going to talk about that same point from the same article um but not not really in the same way um but it was really just more so like i thought that that kind of showed like how like like although Gandhi knew that like uh, that was like his uh, uh like as a husband in his culture that was something that he's supposed to like enforce it's like you could tell that he also did not enforce that because he did let her do what she wanted to do you know um but um oh there's another oh it was the it was when they were talking about the atomic bomb um and like his his view on it being just the the worst um, I guess the worst use of the worst use of science you know because we talked about like the use of science uh, to make weapons and whatnot um, but he was pre he was pretty uh, like set out that you know the atomic bomb was the worst worst use of science that we've had will have etc. Okay, so he doesn't think you solve violence with violence. Right. Yeah. Clearly. Clearly, yeah. <laughs> uh, Jordan, can you talk? Yeah, um, I actually had the same um, point about, I I didn't, okay, I've read a few uh, things about Gandhi uh, and his views on women that weren't the best. Right. So whenever I was reading that beginning, quote um about his wife I was like are you for real like <laughs> like and then I thought about it like the time they were born where they were born and I like I can't follow him too terribly much but still it was kind of like are you for real I didn't enjoy um how much racism he had to endure uh especially with imperialism of England on India um and I found it I found it really funny how he was too afraid to speak as a lawyer. So and I found like the parallel in the way that he taught taught his um, beliefs was through silence and meditation most of the time, which kind of makes sense now that you know that he's just like kind of a shy guy. Yeah, he's an introvert. Mm. Um, okay, so let me um start and I will um, go over the, first of all, do the Gita. And I described the Gita on, um, on the video, but I'll just sort of remind you. 
of it. Um, the principal doctrine is that uh, there's a supreme God, right? And you devote yourself to that. That's the jiva that's inside of you and in the universe. And the things you do, um, you all has to, you have to do without uh, separating yourself from the universe or the jiva. And um, okay, so what happens? He, his religious duty is to go to war with his cousins because they have created negative karma. And he goes there and he sees them and he can't. Like, he, what good is this, you know? And Krishna comes and says, look, you have to do it to recover positive karma, but don't, don't get engaged in it. Don't get emotionally attached to it. Do it because it's a religious duty. Don't, you know, look at outcomes. Don't try to be the bravest. Don't get your ego caught up in it. <laughs> and everyone has certain religious work that they need to do. And they'll find their calling. And then they have to do it in a, in a way that's detached from ego. Okay. Um, and how does that fit with the other religions? Well, the notion of incarnation is in Jesus um, and other religions. And then moderation, we know that we've been through that with uh, the Greeks and Confucius and now Hinduism, the relation between nature and culture, this notion of living for the sake of something greater than yourself. There's a realm of spirituality. We don't just eat and sleep and reproduce right we seek meaning and purpose and we dedicate ourselves to our sense of purpose then there's these virtues this was kind of the main thing i wanted to get out of it because it goes back to aristotle's list it goes back to socrates it goes very much like confucius um, and you're going to find a lot of the same things in buddha and then a lot of the thing, same things in muhammad so then you think about well, why is this, why do these patterns repeat? Well, because they're related to the human condition. Why are they related to the human condition? Well, each one of us is very limited, but we tend to think we know more than we know. We tend to think we're more powerful than we are. And so self-knowledge is really important. Um, not doing harm. Being patient, that's the virtue in relation to anger. Honor is pride. Um, respect for, for the wise, right? So all of these, I assume you can go through the checklist. I have all the you know, answers over on the right-hand side. Um, except then there's the serenity prayer that you change what you can change, that you accept what you can't change and that you have the wisdom to know the difference, that's being truthful, right? Um, that you stay detached, don't get your ego caught up in all these things, how much money you make, or um, don't get your ego caught up in your children, let them live their own lives. Um, don't let anything bother you, don't let anything change your countenance. Um, all right, loving solitude, knowing how to be contemplative is important. Uh, they, you know, it's very different from the US. Stay off your phone, you know, it can be on your phone sometimes, but not all the time because you're going to be totally distracted. You're not going to be able to find the inner Atman. Um, so, character traits, there's another list of them. Fearlessness is courage. Um, striving for wisdom is ambition, um, being generous, open hand, um, governing your appetites, that's temperance, um, love of lonely study, yeah, same, you know, this, so these get translated, there's the original text and it's translated into English, so we have to sort of get a sense of, well, what does it mean, and, um, Slowness, slowness to wrath, right, is anger. Um, 
let let go what other people prize that would be um, sociability don't get into quarrels over petty things um all right so i think i think you get the general idea did anybody have a reaction when they read that or listened to me talk about it did anybody have a comment on that Was anybody surprised? Nobody. Else. I would say I was kind of surprised. <laughs> Not majorly though, but like the new information was like, you know, something I never realized, I guess you would say. Okay, let's do raising hands. Were people at least a little bit surprised? that we keep finding these same patterns. Go ahead, Zane. Oh, uh, one second. I got music playing too, one second. Oh uh, yeah, I was I was a tad bit surprised, kind of like what Lexi said. I don't mean to unmute, but yes, I was gonna raise my hand. Okay, all right, hand raising function. You guys, you all know that. Oh, go ahead, Ryan. Oh, okay, I was just gonna say that I'm not surprised I mean there's a reason why all of these are similar it's because it's like morals and I feel like most of us have similar morals like being courageous being kind being open-handed like that's kind of like I don't know I feel like that's somewhat human nature and I'm not surprised that most philosophies and religions have that because I feel like most people can probably agree with being courageous true to yourself and all of the quality that they're asking you to be right and so that would lend itself to being tolerant of other traditions right because they're all the basic values are the same so if you always look back at the virtues and then you don't worry about doctrine right um so Alyssa, when somebody says we know jesus is real um, do they mean that if somebody doesn't worship Jesus or doesn't accept that, I mean, that isn't part of their worldview, that um, that's a problem for them morally? Um, I don't, I mean, personally, I don't think so. I don't know if that's how, like, my teacher interpreted it. Um like I know technically like as a Christian we're not supposed to you know believe that there are other gods but at the same time like I have a hard time um like I I am able to believe that there might be multiple right answers to like how the universe was correct how it was created and stuff and that people who follow other religions aren't necessarily wrong they just believe different things um and like I do think it comes and like it's tied into like culture and like where they're from in the world like they didn't just come up with these other beliefs you know for like bedtime stories like there, there was some logic between behind every religion to me so that's what makes sense to me i was um i went to my um grandkids house once and i was reading a book about circe a goddess and my granddaughter just asked me what I was reading and I, I start talking about Circe and it just occurred to me you know you could raise a kid to think that there's a great goddess and that everything we see are emanations from the great goddess and have forms of different goddesses like Circe. I mean you could raise a kid to think that and it would be perfectly fine you know <laughs> we would be more in touch with the natural world if they were raised that way. If it's the great earth goddess and the universe is just this emanation of this great goddess who gives us just gives us life and health and birth and all this stuff. Uh, but I wasn't going to do that because I think I would have gotten in trouble. <laughs> but the point is that you know, if the point is to just sort of make yourself aware 
of how much your cultural tradition might inspire you, but it also limits you. And then it gets molded in a certain way. Um, Christianity has been tied to God wants us to exploit the natural world for our well being because we're special. And that's like, <laughs> there's nothing in the Christianity itself that's more cultural, right? That was an interpretation to justify a whole lot of behavior people wanted to engage in. So anyway, that was all right. So now anybody, so I'll go to the next point, which is the nonviolence. So let's go to this um, uh, outline of his life, his message. And it was a longer post today because I did read from the book. Uh, and I hope that you heard it. Let me see. I want a show of hands. How many people watch the video? I really need to know. One, two, three, four, five. Did you, Ryan? No, I just, honestly, it's really hard to be able to catch up with all my things, do everything I need to do, and also watch the video and go to class. Honestly, it's really, I'm trying to do it as much as I can, but it's okay. Really okay, let's look at the hands again, because I think uh, did, well, yeah, you could put the hand raise function too, but um, all right. How about Colin? Did you read it? Um, I got about, I mean, did you listen to it? I, I got, a, I think I had like 10 minutes left on the video. Okay. It was pretty long. So I just want, I definitely, you can understand why, right? I read from something that isn't a reading. So it was in addition. Um, all right, good. Cause then I'll, I will just assume that when you say, when I talk about the massacre at the salt works factory, that you um, know what I mean. Yeah. I, so I'm not home right now, so when you don't have to rush to send the post now. I just wanted to let you know that. I just couldn't get it done last time because I was on the plane, but you don't have to rush to post it like you usually do because I'm in a better time zone. Oh, okay. Let's see. You mean I me reading it? No, it's just I. Is, do you always make it a point to post it before midnight my time? Oh, that's right. You don't have to that's do that right, anymore. Alexis. And I, every time I do it really late, I always think of you too. <laughs> She's going to be mad at me. Uh, okay. Yeah, somehow I, I've even gone to taking walks after class and everything. But okay, thank you, Alexis. That's, that's helpful. Um, okay, so let's go to back to that. Um, there's so many points in here that I think are really important. Um, and this is very, it's very important to understand the history of colonialism, that everybody from a developing country who wanted, who was ambitious for their children, would send them to the West, and would want them to think of the West as superior, and wanted them to imitate the British, or the Americans, or the whoever. British was quite a, obviously in India, British was the thing. But, you know, just imagine that. And if you watch the movie, I, yeah, I would love for you to watch the movie. I'm not going to require it, but it has so many important themes in it. Because today, in those developing countries, there's a whole lot of post-colonialism. But everybody who's outraged about colonialism knows what colonialism was. And so if you hear the outrage, you should actually know what it is they're outraged about. But anyway, so in the movie, he's just really dresses in the three peat suit and he tries desperately to make himself into a Britisher. Um, okay, the Old and New Testament, he read the Gita and, and that was, that's kind of his alter ego. That's what he always remembers. Is to, is to engage in the activity without getting your ego caught up in it. And he always rereads it to find this verse to comfort him, right? Every moment of his life is an effort to live the message of the Gita. Um, it's a summons to 
um, okay, the Orthodox view was caste. It got associated, got corrupted by caste. So, you know, you just remember that you're a Brahmin and you have to do this, or you remember that you're an outcast and, you know, an under, uh, untouchable, and you just stay at peace with yourself. That was not, Gandhi knew that that was a joke, right? It's really about this fight that everyone fights inside of themselves. And Gandhi wanted to overcome caste. So one of his, what he considered his religious duty was to break down the caste system. And he made his wife clean chamber pots, which she was not happy about. She did not like this. <laughs> she didn't go along with all of his uh, social justice stuff. The same thing was true of Nelson Mandela's wife. She created some problems too. Um, but anyway, so maintain detachment. He's on the path of action. Um, and he got called a great yogi. That's the word Mahatman. So that wasn't his real first name, but that was what he was called. Uh, he went back to India. So he went to Britain, went back to India, wasn't very good. He failed, basically. He did these jobs. And then he had these two experiences that completely changed his life. Um, so he go, you have to picture this because um, he goes into this British legal office, administrative office. He tries to get help for his brother and he gets treated like dirt. And he's trying so hard, right? He's got the suit, he's got the haircut, he's got the accent and they treat him like dirt. And then when he was in South Africa, he was on the first class car, you know, I'm gonna be one of these sell out, <laughs> no, sophisticated natives. Um, and he got kicked off the car. He got put to the um, poor folk car. And that was it. Like within those, those two things just made Gandhi feel like, I'm not gonna kiss up to these people anymore. Like I'm going to respect my own tradition because I know they're not following the Sermon on the Mount. And I know the Gita has a very, very good message. Why am I selling out? Why am I buying into this? They're hypocrites. And they're even maybe worse than hypocrites because they're abusing their power. They're using it to oppress my people. And that's when he started about white discrimination, about oppression. He woke up. This, I think, is a very important quote. And I think you guys should think about have you ever been in groups where people feel honored by humiliating somebody else? Just think about it, you know, because that is awful. And I would suspect it probably happens, especially in our polarized situation. We cannot denigrate the people we disagree with. That's very important. Um, all right, then he organized an ambulance corps to help the British and they rejected it. We don't want help from you, low lives. Well, then they needed help. And so um, he got involved in raising his kids. So he's breaking down sexist stereotypes and expectations. He's raising, he's breaking down caste system. He's focusing on his inner life and his religion made him political. Cause if you wanna stay in touch with the jiva, and create positive karma. You've got to get rid of all of this crap, this socialized social oppression. So it made him political and his politics were always religious. So you do it without losing touch of the soul force, okay? You have to live the truth. And that's like Jesus, he says, I am the way, the truth and the light. And Socrates felt like he's living the truth about the universe. Then he started this movement and um, he did change the laws non-violently. Um, he, he lived simply, um, he looked beyond national freedom to social liberation, right? It isn't just about um, politics. It's about living at a higher level. Um, okay. He promoted village, village uplift, helping people help themselves. And then um, there were five years when nothing happened. So it's not like it's 
every day it was better and better. Um, okay, then in in World War II, right? He's they're completely shocked by how evil the West is, <laughs> and um, and so they started their activism. And the Salt Works massacre was just day after day, 25 people would march down and they'd get beaten. And it was the British hired native people from India, indigenous people to do the beating, to do the dirty work. So they gave them really good jobs um, as long as they would do this dirty work. And so of course they're, um, they're stuck. Right, they want to provide for their families, so they know just how to do it. Okay, so um, the raids and beatings continued for several days, and the writer says India was now free. Legally, technically, nothing had changed, but there was a difference. Um, Europe has completely lost her formal moral prestige in Asia. She can't, she's no longer regarded as the champion throughout the world of fair dealing and the exponent of high principle, but as the upholder of Western race supremacy and the exploiter of those outside her own borders. For Europe, this is a great moral defeat. Even though Asia is physically weak and unable to protect herself from aggression, nevertheless, she can now afford to look down on Europe, whereas before she looked up. The Salt March did two things. It gave the Indians the conviction that they could lift the foreign yoke from their shoulders, and it made the British aware that they were subjugating India. So it was inevitable that eventually um, the British would leave. So I do want you, that, that would be how the spiritual side of nonviolent civil disobedience. Um, and I think Martin Luther King also had a sense of dignity and a lot of the demonstrators just had incredible sense of their own dignity, the way he trained them not to act violently. And it just exposed, right? It exposed white supremacy. So what do you think is happening now with Black Lives Matter? What do you think about the white supremacy movements? Um, I mean, what do you think? What do you guys think this is exposing about our society? Um, Colin? Um, I think it's in a fragile place right now that it, whatever happens, the media is gonna spin it to whichever way that they want. So if the Black Lives Matter movement is like actually going well and improving and one minor event happens that's the only thing that's going to be on the news yeah but as a citizen what do you think i mean no you don't have to watch the media you can you make your own decision about do you think this movement exposed white supremacy that people don't want people are racist and explicit about it or do you think it exposed, you know, that black people don't want to, in, I mean, what, whatever. <laughs> you have to decide moving forward, what are the lessons learned? What should we learn from what happened? Um, do you have a view of that? Um, I, I mean, racism, especially like my, personal like views with it and stuff like that has always been apparent uh and things of that nature because I'm mixed and my family is not from America so I have all these things that are just like weird or not weird but like not natural when they came over like my grandparents uh got off the plane in the middle of the 60s uh so they really didn't have rights back then especially not being American so they I've always been taught like racism is a thing and I don't think that the Black Lives Matter movement is bringing more of a light to racism I think 
that is just poking holes in like pol- uh, more polices and things of that nature. But I think one of the big takeaways that's going to happen is going to be how influential social media is with starting movements and keeping everyone together. Anybody else? Not everybody has to clock in on this, but I do want you to think about what do you want the takeaway to be? Um, For me, like, I think that it's just painted a more clear picture of like what types of racism certain people are tolerant to like what they're willing to accept in our society they think that's a reasonable amount that it's okay that even if it's a small amount that it still exists and like like I'm not saying that it's a small amount of systemic racism left in America but it's just it's really shown like true colors on like who's comfortable with it I feel like do you know about replacement theory we don't want to be replaced yeah a little bit I mean that's if more than 50 percent of America is not white skin that's going to be some kind of a horrible thing is that true I mean I don't think so obviously and I think it also boils down to you know we've always been shown all these pictures from the civil rights movement and black and white and it's made to seem like it was so long ago but those people are still alive and like functioning members of our society and like those are people's grandparents or just parents and it's just shown to me like they're willing to excuse it now for like, I mean, they've always been willing, but like who's blatantly ignoring the like racism within their family. Okay. Anybody else? Because I mean, in your generation, what you think is the lesson learned is what you carry forward and the culture that you create. So it doesn't matter, you know, go ahead, Alexis. So I honestly think that with the whole Black Lives Matter situation and the, um, like with the society so focused on racism, you don't understand, like a lot of people are not understanding that the littlest things can be so offensive. That what? That the littlest things can be so offensive. Okay. I grew up going to class and having conversations about Black people and then everyone staring at me because I was the Black person in the class and uh, it's uncomfortable and it's unreckoning uh, and with the whole black lives matter movement i'm so sorry that people's buildings are getting destroyed i'm so sorry that target was torn down or that people can't get to work on a tra- timely fashion because the streets are full of people with black lives matter movement in all honesty i'm going to be blunt here i don't care I don't care if people's buildings were torn down. I don't care if the target's not allowed to be there anymore. I don't care if um, the police officers are scared to um, go work the Black Lives Matter movement. I want to be okay enough to be pulled over by a cop and not shake with fear. I want to be okay to go to Batesville, Arkansas and not get slurs, slurs yelled at me and be called um, the N-word and being like, it's all about what makes everyone comfortable yeah a lot of people are scared because of black the black socially and all this is becoming really popular well we're not stopping you from being popular it's just what's in right now is in right now the 90s look i'm not i'm not able to do that i can't physically do a 90s i gotta wear braids and my curls prevent me from doing that it's just so i'm i but black people aren't stopping that and saying oh it's unfair because i can't do that we it's all about your perspective and what is better for everyone and not just one so if one person and part of the everyone is not safe and not okay then everyone should be making sure that everyone is safe again that's just my opinion and like going off of what she just said I think it also brought to light how like you know people like to say that act like um, all the racism in the United States just exists in the South, but like all of these influential moments, like these tragedies that have sparked riots have taken place in Northern states. 
and yet like blame is still placed on like southern states oh actually my dad was in selma and when we got home we got all these hate calls and so it was obvious to me you know people are just as racist in the north so i i never thought that that was true um, it's honestly all over but that's the thing though it's important for it to be learned to be taught to be like if you if you see someone saying something that's completely wrong or like clearly wrong it's everyone's job to correct it i came to batesville arkansas and the first thing was told to me when i wore my natural hair is that your natural hair or did you curl it like that's offensive to me that's like it does it's a simple question because you're curious but going up to someone and reaching and touching my hair and trying oh to gosh. go like oh that's not normal for mine is that even real like that's offensive right tim okay so i think like they just made like a clear cut of how racist people can be and what like accepted basically because like certain certain things you say is racist to certain people and others are not, but at the same time it's still racist at the end of the day. So like, kind of like for example, when um whenever it's Black History Month and stuff, they play like these um these stuff the videos when you were like younger they played like in the videotapes and stuff. I don't really get affected by the Black History stuff. I mean I mean slavery and stuff. Cause obviously I wasn't alive. But just to play that stuff and see how my type of people were like treated, that like, gives me like not chills, but like kind of gives me aggravated. And like it's kind of weird being like one of the few black people in the class, and you know it's about slavery, and like nobody wants to like look at you because you might look at them crazy. It's like, mm. like I'm not saying that's racist, but it's like you know that intentions are kind of close, especially like I see some videos on the internet. Um, for example, I saw one yesterday at a train station, like an old school one, it's like outside. You know, um, people like were eating, and I guess one dude was going to get arrested because he was clearly eating. I don't know; it makes no sense. And he just got picked out of all those people at the train station. He's all the way at the end for eating, and it's like, come on now, you 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 clear cut. You trying to make it seem like. He didn't pick him out of everybody, but he's way across the thing. I'm pretty sure air people eat outside the train station until they get on and they throw it away. It was like, they just made a real clear cut. And another thing was, like I said earlier in some type of videos, the White House being invaded. If those were black people, they all would have died. It's clear cut racism at that point. Yeah, okay. For a so fact, they would have died. Yeah, so you do have to think about this in terms of leading the next, gen, you know, being the leaders in another mm -hmm. 20 years. The other thing I wanted to point out was that how racist Winston Churchill was. He was so racist. Uh, and I do want you to, to watch the video and I'll write, I don't have time to read it, I don't think now, but the things he said about Gandhi was just awful the half naked fakir, I, I have no intention of sitting across a table with this guy, this low life guy. Oh my gosh, just awful. Um, and so then the second part of that, the excerpts that I read quite a bit of was his religious views. And he's just very multi, very interfaith. He, you know, said he didn't experience any mystical experience of God that he thinks of. He's definitely on the path of action, the truth force. So it's a kind of action where you're living out the truth. Um, he didn't try to prove God. And then he just, it didn't make any sense to him that one religion would be closer to God than another one. And he just, he said things like, um, Gandhi doubted that only the sacred Hindu Vedas were the revealed word of God. Why not the Bible? Why not the Quran? Because Gandhi was born Hindu. I'm a Christian and a Hindu and a Muslim and a Jew. Um, uh, God uses many instruments. Um, and some people think, you know, Mahatma Gandhi was 
like a prophet. Um, it's just his message to Christians is that 20th century people can be authentic Christians, but they have to actually do it, you know. Then he says, why uh, did God have only one son, right? If he had one, why not another? In Hinduism, there's been a number of human incarnations of the Almighty. Uh, why can I go to heaven and attain salvation only as a Christian? Was God a Christian? <laughs> I believe that in the other world, there are neither Hindus nor Christians nor Muslims. Um, Gandhi occasionally chided the missionaries for making Christians of hungry in Indians, you know, they would feed them. They'd say, okay, if you convert, then I'll feed you. And Gandhi said, why don't you just make us better Hindus? Um, and then we'll be better people. Um, but if it's the Sermon on the Mount, he said, sure, I'm a Christian, if that's what it's about. It's just that it's not important. The orthodoxy, the set of words that you have is not important. It's the way you live. And that's, you know, the main theme of the class. It just comes over and over again. And that was the way Gandhi thought. So the next one is the reading from Thomas Merton about, um, about Eastern, Western, um, the one-eyed giant that the West is out of balance in terms of thinking science will save us. Um, and I can ask how many of you read it. So again, I'm gonna ask for a show of hands. And there's an article of, uh, by his, I think his grandson after 9-11. Let me see. I think there's an outline. Yeah, there's an outline of this here. After this, there are the quotes. So um, first of all, I'm gonna ask you how many of you read it and then we can go over some of these quotes. Read um, those quotes or read the excerpt? Read the, read the article, it was like 14 pages. Uh, I read like some of it. I didn't have time to read all of it. Okay, Alyssa read it. So let's do the thumbs up reaction and see. Okay, Ryan read it. Okay. All right. So I do, I would like you to read it. Um, what happened to Zane? He disappeared. Um, all right. He's so here. He can't like talk for some reason. His mic isn't working. Oh, well, that's okay. I didn't see his, his name there, but I probably wasn't looking hard enough. Okay, so here we go. We have 24 minutes. Um, neither ancient wisdom nor modern science are complete. So they don't stand alone. So you have to have science plus values. And that's, again, why I start with Aristotle's virtues, because... They focus on moral virtue and then intellectual virtue. So you have to have been raised with moral virtue. And then when you get trained in intellectual things, uh, subjects, which includes math, science, but also rhetoric, logic, um, then you will tie those things to values. And that would be the completely flourishing life is uh, achieves excellence in all areas, intellectual and moral. Um, through the spiritual traditions of the West, he discovered his own Indian tradition and his own right mind. So what I'm suggesting is that by studying the spiritual traditions of the East, my students can figure out you know, their own minds. Now, um, they might even change that some of them might become Buddhists, some of my students, of course, come to class and they're already Buddhist. Um, but any one of these positions is perfectly viable for anyone to, to pick up on. Let's see, he was able to show people of the West a way to recover their own right mind in their own tradition. And so if we are all exercising the virtues, we're gonna come together. The different cultural contexts is not gonna be a divider. And so you know that religions currently, as authoritarian governments rise, religion is one of their tools. 
It's a tool of authoritarian societies to weaponize religion, to say the authoritarian leader says, well, we have one main uh, uh, nation, national religion. And if you don't convert to that, you're, you know, we have a right to discriminate against you um, because you're not morally up to snuff or because we only trust people in this religion to actually run our government because someone else would not run it in our interests to promote our, I don't know, empire. <laughs> so that's, it's important that you know, religion is used as a weapon every time there's a rise in authoritarianism. Um, the communist countries, their religion was basically um, communism. But okay, so he realized the people of India were awakening in him. So they had to, they saw themselves in Gandhi. Now think about that. Have you had a mentor, a teacher, somebody you really respect and you see yourself in them or they have a way of communicating with you where they can see you, right? They can see you spiritually. And so there's a connection there. That's, those are the kinds of people, vision carriers, right? They carry your vision for you or they help you understand your own calling. So that was what uh, Gandhi represented. These people awakening that they are inferior, that they do have a really high level of spirituality. Um, and the interior life is not just private, it can be public. So given that um, India specialized on turning inward, Gandhi brought that into the path of work and you can also turn it outward. All the political acts were also religious acts of fulfilling his um, duty, his religious duty. Um, okay, they were acts of religious worship. So, okay. And then the claim is that the greatest spirit of man's spiritual needs is the need to be delivered from evil and falsity in himself and in his society. And that's what Socrates, right, was trying to make the Athenians aware of their self-deception and their delusions. But Jesus also was trying to get the Jewish leaders to be aware of the corruption underneath their appearance of being especially pious and holy. Um, okay, so sin is already a punishment. So we always should feel compassion for sinners. We have to be able to experience their sin as if it were our own. And uh, in my case, you know, this political polarization, I just, I can identify with people that I disagree with. I really, I don't know. I just feel like I have empathy and um, you can understand where they're coming from, but it's very hard, right? To sort of communicate them across these barriers because there's so much, so many distractions and so many false narratives, but deep down inside, um, we're all more alike than different, especially because I raised my kids um, for a while in the ghetto of Philadelphia and with not a lot of money. So I, I, you know, it was shocking. It was, I wasn't used to it because I'd been middle-class, but it helped me have a lot more empathy. And um, I did manage to get out of that, but for people who can't find a way out, it's hard, like it's understandable to want to find some way to have a secure future. Um, so there's, there's no reason for the polarization. It's just really toxic and unhealthy. The, okay, so we're always weaving society together. That's why I'm telling you that you're the next leaders and you have to figure out, right? And you have to focus, you know, there's only one little tiny piece that you might do to contribute. Just like me, I had to figure out why well, I really want to teach philosophy. <laughs> uh, most people don't want to do that, but that was my way, right? 
of thinking that I would um, tackle what I thought was um, social diseases like religious intolerance or um, hypocrisy, all these general things. That's what I thought uh, was important. A dialectic, but you have to you have to acknowledge the presence of evil. You can't just be pie in the sky. Um, when Jesus teaches forgiveness, he's not naive, right? Uh, as a matter of fact, it's naive. It's much more naive to think you can raise people to be greedy or power hungry and think that the society is not going to collapse. That is pie in the sky. Okay. It's not pie in the sky to say you have to raise kids to want to find something meaningful. And there's plenty of obstacles. This is not utopia. <laughs> but if you don't do that, society will decline. Um, what is a mature political consciousness? Okay. He lived in, he taught us to regulate life by the eternal law. Um, Nonviolence is a quality of the heart. Um, the animal is violent, the spirit is nonviolent. Uh, he did not think bombs were going to make things peaceful. <laughs> and um, yeah, so, so which of those quotes do you want to respond to or something you read in that article? Okay, Colin. Um. Was this the article that was pretty much like, you can't understand what's wrong if you can't understand yourself? Blinking that on. was just the main article I assigned for today. There was only one main article I assigned for today. Oh, it's the Thomas Merton one, right? Gandhi and the One-Eyed Giant. Oh, yeah. Um, I forgot the exact words of it, but the way that I took it was like, you can't wish to change something until you're able to like, understand what really needs to be changed right so know thyself uh your capacity for evil and good and then you can start dealing with people does that make sense yes okay if you think well i'm good but i know there's these evil people out there no you're not going to fix anything it's just toxic um you can think i have done things like that or i have thought of doing all these nasty things so I know, you know, I could do it. And so that, that helps you figure out, well, how am I going to treat other people? How am I going to structure the society so people don't get desperate? Um, just things like that. And then also you're much more likely to, to be eager to talk to other people and get different perspectives because you know your, your own is limited. That's why. Um, Tim, did you have a reaction? To reading the article or to the quotes so like what you just said about like doing i think it's something about doing bad and not expecting the world to like punish you for it i think you just said it too before you asked on something about um doing doing wrong like, oh man it's just the yeah. thing that, well, I wouldn't do something like that, you know. Huh. Um, if you think that, then you're, I mean, I can understand the position of a black guy in the presence of white police officers, but huh. I can also understand the position of white police officers if they've already been to war and they probably have PTSD <laughs> and they're just there in these situations. Uh, but I can understand, obviously, I just think you could have empathy. And that's why what you're looking for are police departments that are really trying to self-regulate, that are having community uh, policing. That's what you're going to look for, is, is places that are trying to fix it because they know it's a problem on both sides, that it just, we can't live like this. Is that, is that what you're getting at, Tim? Basically. Yeah. I mean, if you don't have empathy, and then, you know, the white guys have the guns. So you have to remember that. Um, 
it's just, it's such a difficult situation. And I always think, what do I know? I just would hope that they would, somebody would set up programs where people start having dialogues and start interact, interacting and start solving the problem. And I, what do I know? You know, I'm isolated. Mm -hmm. um, does that seem fair, Tim? I mean, we should solve more because like it's kind of it hurts to say or see that some people are like losing their lives for cops which is well not, not trained enough especially their training is very short time too so, yeah there's so much history there it's dysfunctional yeah um so somebody's got to expose it and start solving it um yeah, that Uvalde shooting, that's a terrible story. Uh, gal. Okay, Ryan? Um, just speaking on this topic, um, yeah, I definitely think somebody needs to change the system, especially when it comes to racism. Um, but I think it's like important, like you said, to have empathy. And with empathy, empathy you can have like more like understanding but also like a lot of things in society, like even like some of the shootings and stuff, it's like, and even like police, like brutality and stuff, it doesn't always have to do with race. Like that's a lot of the times, like it is the case. But I think sometimes if we're already in that, which people have trauma, so that's, it makes sense that they're already in that mindset in defense mode. But sometimes I feel like it's important for us to like take a step back because we may assume it's a certain racist, like, um, action or it's like meant in a certain way but it may not be the case and that just perpetuates so I think like what you said about having empathy like it goes both ways like a lot of people are really quick for or really quick to jump on like the cops and stuff like that but then when something happens you expect the cops to put their lives in danger when you know and it's their job but they're humans too so they make mistakes so if you're able to rely on them when, um, you know, they may make, uh, when they, you know, protect you, you should be able to like support them if they make a mistake. But I'm not supporting like um, the racist actions, like, you know, but I'm just saying like sometimes there is like, people are really quick to jump on the idea that they think it may mean a certain way or a certain thing when it doesn't. Yeah, but black well, people, the story, people 400 years. 400 years of getting treated so badly, but go ahead, Tim. Well, I was going to say, I know some families, like, or a lot of people I know, like, they'll do anything but call the cops. Because, like, I, I understand you shouldn't want to, not every, not every encounter is always racist. But since they're in defense mode, like she said, some people don't even want to align themselves with the cops at all, unless, like, you need to 100%. Like, they will rather deal with it themselves and that will cause even more problems. That's how bad it's, it's deeply rooted. Like some people yeah. that dead serious, like avoid them as much as possible. Yeah. It's... See that a lot in women. What? You see that a lot in women. You see women not wanting to call the cops for situations. Th um, one out of three um, rapes are actually been um, registered in cops. One out of three have been told to the cops. The other two just don't want to affiliate with the cops. They don't want to affiliate with the society norm of someone who's been raped. So you see that a lot more in women than you see in the men. In Southeast Asia, it's even worse because you, if you, if anybody finds out your daughter is raped, she's not marryable. <laughs> so it's a free for all, you know. Uh, go ahead, Ryan. Oh, I was just going to speak on, like, because, um, like, when you were, like, oh, it's, like, 400 years, like, of oppression and history, like, I am not dismissing the fact that there's, like, obvious history of, like, slavery, injustices, and so on, so forth. I'm just saying that, like, at what point do we try to, like, move past this? Because, like, a lot of the people that, like, I'm just going to speak from my experience, like, I talk to people, and they're, like, like, I hate white men, I hate white people. And I'm just like, a lot of these white people, like, it's just so like generalized. And I think like, there is, I, I don't agree with the idea of you can't be racist to white people. I think you can. 
and that's just my opinion I know some people think not but um I'm just saying that like at what point do we put those aside if like to try to move forward because I know some people that just won't let that happen and and I get like I'm not trying to say you have to totally forget the history like I know that there's still systemic racism but then if we keep referring to it and then having these traumas and like having this hate towards people who actually probably never did any like never intentionally did something racist or whatever it may be like that was our history yeah you but know? what about housing i mean black people still can't get decent housing and then they can't yeah, get but i don't think it's just white people, black that's people can't get a lot of things a lot of black people can't get a lot of things like i don't live my life every day thinking about slavery i don't think dang if i was back then you know what i'd be a house slave I would be a house slave. I don't think about that every day. Like, I'm not hating on you, Ryan. I'm just saying, like, a no, lot of the I times, mean, I, I, I don't think, that. I don't think about slavery until someone says, "Go back to your country." I don't think about slavery until someone calls me the n-word for just walking down the street. I don't think about slavery until a white woman walks past me clutching her purse because I'm I'm broke and I'm cheap and I don't have the money because like many reasons i don't think about it until we're in those situations i agree with you we need to drop the whole thing we need like to move on from this we need to drop the whole thing we need to stop putting you're different from me because you have a past and i don't we need to we need to drop that completely it's just when is that point when is that point where people on both sides are going to drop it i honestly think the black side is going the black people my people are going to drop it once we stop being judged for it because I honestly tell people all the time when they tell me to go back to my country, well, you brought me here against my will. That's, okay. and they don't realize that. Okay, we have four more people in about four more minutes. So, Michael? Do you just want like my comment from the specific reading that you were Yeah, reading? I think so, yeah. Okay. Um, so I took it actually not from the like original reading, but from the article that you had posted at the very end of it. Um, and um, they were talking, I can't remember exactly what they were talking about, because I just got, I was just following the other conversation. Uh, but the, the, the thing that I took out of it was this uh, quote, uh, justice should mean uh, reformation and not revenge. Um, and how uh, <laughs> basically just like uh they just goes along with like his idea that nonviolence doesn't really like uh i'm sorry that um violence is not not always the answer but some, but also like sometimes it's necessary um to elicit change when other things aren't occurring um if, if that makes sense uh, like we've talked about like how like big things have have to be used in today's society as catalysts to actually to actually elicit change uh, so that's what I was trying to tie that back into okay um, Jordan I think that um, I, I'm really siding with Alexis on this especially uh, I, I don't know. I think that there is a deeper issue than that. just people um, are scared. I think people are racist. I think that that's the reason why we have proportionally more people of color in jail than we do any white people, even though there's more white people in America. It, it's kind of insane to me that the idea that a population that makes up 18% of the nation is in prisons 45 like makes up 45 percent of prisons that's pretty insane i think that's a very telling demographic um so i i think that as much as we want to try and humanize these people i hate the idea of blue lives matter because you can take off that uh uniform you can't take off your skin i just i don't see a lot of the value that people are saying have empathy for them when they have no empathy for the people that they're supposedly policing. So. Okay. Alyssa? Um, from what I got from the article, I think it just shows like 
the dangers of a being ignorant to um you know like problems within your society but even more so being aware of them and still uh staying content like you know you can choose to go the non-violent route or you could choose to go a violent route you can choose any route but if you're not actively trying to like fix these problems and you're well aware that they exist um like you're just as bad as the people causing the problems because you're you're just choosing to stay silent in the moment and like with like you know blue lives matter and black lives matter and everything like it's hard to defend blue lives matter like i feel like unless you know they're actively working within their like you know agency to try to fix the problem that everyone is it's very obvious that we have then you're no better than those like bad cops it doesn't matter if you're like a good apple and you follow the rules unless you're trying to like prevent more bad cops then like i just feel like you're not as good as but i mean you're just as bad as them okay zane um well i was like like me personally i was raised with a very diverse friend group so like I wasn't even like aware or like understanding what racism was. So I was in about probably seventh grade or eighth grade. I like, I mean, it just didn't comprehend to me like why that was even a thing. So, I mean, and I read somewhere after uh, the George Floyd incident, like racism is, isn't uh, natural. It's taught. So, I mean, obviously, I mean, I'm not dumb. I'm not dumb enough to say that racism isn't happening all over the place. Cause I know it is. So, I mean, there's got to be something done. I mean, I'm not sure, like, where the root is or where it's being taught at, but, I mean, it's obviously still out there. So, there needs to be a system change. I mean, I think the only way that we're going to move past it and kind of stop, I mean, obviously, we're always going to have that history there. I mean, that's just common sense. But, I mean, for us to get past it and kind of grow together and be, you know, not polarized and be unified, there's that teaching of, you know, one is, you know, superior above the other that's just got to stop somewhere and i think there's just got to be a lot of discussion about it and i think i mean i agree with a lot of the blm and what they stand for and stuff like that i mean i'm not one of those southern people that's all against it i mean i i, I mean i totally agree with it but uh it needs to, there needs to be a, a discussion about it for, for sure so actually that target you know for the black lives matter that's a couple miles from where i live and the demonstration was two blocks from where my daughters went to high school and it really is a problem in Minnesota, the housing situation, because it's very hard for a, an African-American to buy a house on an amortized loan where they build equity in a neighborhood where the values of the home go up. And so that's what I think about, um, because in the Twin Cities, if you live in a, in a nice middle-class house, like you make 15,000 bucks a year, just on equity without doing anything. And that builds over time a lot. And so that's just a huge problem. And people might say they're not racist, but the system is set up. And then the schools in the poorer neighborhoods don't get as much money per pupil. And out in the suburbs, the houses are worth more. So they pay more real estate tax and that goes to the schools. So you have more money per student and it's just so systemic and there are a lot of minnesotans who don't think they're racist but i mean it's not just about your heart <laughs> it's about the system uh, does everybody understand that um i think sometimes in um rural arkansas the housing values don't go up like they do in big cities and so people don't understand that, that a lot of people's wealth is just because they had access to one of these amortized loan houses. And that's how their, their wealth started. So that's, that's, you know, what I think about here in Minnesota. And I don't know how much has changed um, since I moved, right? I moved after the biggest demonstrations um, you just kind of try to get a feel for it, but it is a big problem um, because there's the appearance of things and then there's the reality and it's hard to know, but you really want the police 
you know, the, the system, the people who are in it and understand it are the ones who really would have the best judgment about how to fix it. Does that make sense? Um, so then, you know, each of you decides, right, what your career is going to involve, and it might be focused on that. Um, the legal system, I'm very disappointed in it lately. Supreme Court judgments and things very much favor the wealthy, which means white. So people can live in their little silos and the legal system, when the legal system doesn't help lift up the poor, then again, you've got systemic problems that aren't gonna go away. Does anybody have a comment about that or a question? Um, so yeah, I don't know how many of you are following all the Supreme Court decisions, not just the Roe v. Wade, but some of the other ones, it's just they're favoring <laughs> a few, I think, and I'm pretty worried about that, but okay, well, I'll see you tomorrow. Tomorrow we do Hinduism and women, the environment, art. Um, it's kind of the last day on Hinduism, so okay, we'll see you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Um,